Hey, what's going on? This is Eric Olson for Science Centric. So let's imagine for a moment that you're a space alien and you've somehow discovered planet Earth and you come to planet Earth and there's nothing alive on the planet. And you're digging down through the layers of Earth and you come upon the layer that corresponds to the time that we live in. What would you expect to find there? What would be the species or creatures that would define the time that we live in. Well, a new paper out in the Royal Society Open Science Journal argues that that species, that creature, would be the chicken. The authors of this paper, who are at Leicester University in the UK, lay out an argument that the chicken is the representative species of our time. If you were an alien and you were digging back down through the layers of earth and you discovered a species, you would see this signature, this mark represented by the chicken that humans had fundamentally transformed the earth. So let's take a look at their paper and we'll just go through it. I think it's really interesting and we'll learn a lot about the chicken along the way, just how much it's become a part of our current existence and how prevalent of a food item it is across the world. Okay, the paper is titled The Broiler Chicken as a Signal of a Human Reconfigured Biosphere. And the biosphere, of course, in this case is planet Earth. The authors write that Accelerating human-driven physical, chemical, and biological changes to the Earth's system have been profound, sparking suggestions of a new geological epoch, the Anthropocene. Human consumption trends have driven unprecedented changes to the Earth's biosphere. Populations of wild animal groups have plummeted in recent decades, while human and livestock populations have risen. The biomass of humans and their domesticated animals, including livestock, now outweighs that of all wild terrestrial vertebrates. So terrestrial vertebrates there, that means anything that walks on land and has a backbone, which is crazy. Understanding the nature of this change is important to help protect biodiversity. Domesticated chickens are a striking example of a human reconfigured biosphere. They are the world's most numerous bird with a standing population of 22.7 billion. This population is an order of magnitude greater than the standing stocks of the most abundant wild bird species, the red-billed quillea, approximately 1.5 billion, house sparrows, approximately 0.5 billion, rock doves, which are pigeons, approximately 0.25 billion. Other farmed birds at uh, turkeys at 0.3 billion, geese, 0.3 billion, so on and so forth, farm pigs and cattle, um... In Europe, the population of domesticated chickens in 2009 was greater than the combined population of the 144 most numerous wild bird species. It is likely to be the largest standing population of a single bird species in Earth's history. So that right there, I think that the authors have a pretty good case for why the chicken would be a, a symbol of the times that we live in. I guess the other question is, are chicken bones going to be preserved in the in the in the rock layers like, you know, dinosaur bones or something like that, which I think they address later on in the paper. The paper continues, chicken meat consumption is growing faster than any other type of meat type and is soon to outpace pork. Expanding consumption in developing countries is driving the trend. This has had a profound impact on the biology of the broiler. Since the Chicken of Tomorrow program in the early 1950s, Chicken of Tomorrow, it sounds like a, maybe a ride at Disneyland, a potential ride. Uh, in the early 1950s, launched to encourage the development of higher meat-yielding birds. Chickens have undergone extraordinary changes. From the mid-20th century to the present, broiler growth rates have soared, with up to f- a five-fold increase in individual biomass. Here we document the biology of the broiler, from the Roman era to the present and discuss whether the biological changes to the broiler are distinctive enough to make them a marker species of the proposed Anthropocene epoch. Changes to the broiler skeleton, diet, and genetics have the potential to be fossilized. The current dominance of the 
the domesticated chicken as the world's most numerous bird species would not be possible without modern technology. The system of industrial chicken production and its export around the world has facilitated surging chicken meat consumption. Separate broiler breeding units, farm slaughterhouses, processing plants, and marketing are coordinated into one system called vertical integration. First implemented in the U.S. in the 1950s, vertical, vertical integration systems now account for 97% account for 97 of U.S. broiler production. Industrial chicken farming is now widespread around the globe and has enabled a rapid rise in broiler production from the 1950s. In 2006, it was estimated that 70% of broilers were intensively reared. The system epitomizes efficient and high volume food production. The, let's see, the top broiler Tyson's food slaughtered 35 million chickens per average week in 2012. And KFC, the world's largest chicken meat retailer, has over 25,000 stores in 125 countries worldwide. So we eat a, a lot of chicken in my household where not, nobody is a vegetarian. We do try to eat vegetarian meals uh, as much as we can, but we do like chicken as a source of protein. One thing that we've noticed that my wife and I have noticed in uh, is that the quality of the chicken that we are getting now compared to even when we were growing up as kids in the 1980s is that the quality of the meat is is not as good especially the breast meat tends to be really mm, mushy i would say so this industrial method of farming chickens it's definitely producing a lot of meat the quality of the meat again i just i don't think it's there Okay, so back to the paper. The domestic chicken originated from the red jungle fowl, native to tropical South Southeast Asia. Contemporary non-indigenous red jungle fowl occur in the Americas, Australia, Europe, and Africa due to deliberate human translocation and are adapted to a much wider climate range than indigenous birds. The fossil record, record of the red jungle fowl is poorly known, but molecular clock estimates place the origin of the order Galliformis, which includes pheasants, jungles, fowl, jungle fowl, and relatives in the early Cretaceous. So that's, you know, the time of dinosaurs. However, the archaeological record of chicken domestication and husbandry is relatively well documented. Archaeological studies had suggested that chickens were domesticated circa 8,000 years ago, although ongoing DNA and dating research is likely to bring this date forward. Domesticated chicken bones are recorded from the Indus Valley as early as 2500 to 2100 BCE. The time transgressive spread of domesticated chickens out of Asia is contemporaneous with the establishment of new trade routes. For example, chickens were introduced to the Iberian Peninsula by Phoenician traders in the first century. Spanish colonists introduced domesticated chickens to the New World. Okay, back to the paper's main point, which is that the the chicken is sort of the the signature species of the Anthropocene. So the domestic the the um, domestication of chickens happened about eight thousand years ago. The Anthropocene, although there's debate about this, started about two thousand years ago. So there's definitely some overlap there. But I think their argument is that the production of chicken on a mass scale didn't really get going until fairly recently. Okay, so as the authors mentioned, they looked at all these chicken bones that had been dug up by the Museum of London and also other bones that had been found in China and are much older, going back to the, time, the Roman times. Uh, you know, the time of Jesus. And um, I won't go too much into the methods, but suffice it to say, they were looking at the, the tibiotarsis of these chicken bones. The tibiotarsis is the uh, sort of shin bone and also the top of the foot, which I guess in chickens in particular is partially fused together. And this is a good marker a proxy for how big the chicken is i'm guessing because it supports the weight of the bird and they found that over time this tibiotarsis is getting thicker and heavier and um even more recently in the last say 100 years it's you know jumped up um 
considerably, again, probably back to that industrial farming that they were talking about. And so we'll skip ahead in the paper to what they found. Um, so they say the size of chicken bones from multiple, multiple archaeological sites in London is recorded from the Roman era to the end of the 19th century compared against a red jungle fowl and two broiler data, data sets. Modern broiler skeletons are significantly larger than both the wild progenitor bird and archaeological domestic chickens. The greatest distal breadth of the tibio tarsus, again, that's the shin and sort of the top of the, the foot, is, is, is in some specimens twice the width in a six-week-old six modern broiler than in an adult red jungle fowl. More dramatic is a direct comparison of juvenile broiler and red jungle fowl lower limb bones of the same age, which shows a tripling in width and doubling in length from the Roma era, Roman era until 1340. The distal widths of the domesticated chicken tibio tarsi in London were similar to those of their red jungle fowl ancestor. Sustained increases in the size of chickens from 1340 to 1650 are concurrent with size increases in other domesticated livestock. The average distal tibio tarsus, tarsus width measurements from 1650 up until 1900 remained fairly constant. While the archaeological record for chickens indicates alterations in bone morph morphology related to domestication, the speed and scale of changes escalated considerably in the second half of the 20th century. A surge in chicken production from the 1950 onward has resulted in a increase over this period in the mass of individual birds. We quantify how the growth rate of broilers has changed over the 20th century by a compilation of data from several commercial breeds. There's been a steady increase in growth rate since 1964, and the growth rate of modern broilers is now three times higher than that of the red jungle fowl. However, data from the 21st century show that the growth rate is slowing and may be reaching a plateau. Basically, they're saying that because of this increased growth that the chickens have a lot more deformities in their bones and things like that, uh, which obviously isn't necessarily a good thing and probably bad for these birds overall. Okay, so let's g move on to the discussion section of the paper. I think this is actually probably the most interesting part of the paper. The intensive production of broilers and rising rates of consumption increases the standing biomass of domesticated chickens year on year. Over 65.8 billion meat chicken carcasses were consumed were consumed globally in 2016, and this is set to continue rising. This may be an underestimate given the standing population of 22.7 billion and a lifespan of five to seven weeks. The contrast between the lifespan of ancestral red jungle fowl uh, and that of broilers means that the potential rate of carcass accumulation of chickens is unprecedented in the natural world. Irrespective of the number of broiler chickens killed per annum, the standing population of 22.7 billion chickens is striking and mirrors other population data comparing domesticated with wild animal populations. For example, the biomass of a domesticated cattle is 250 times higher than that of elephants. The standing biomass of domesticated poultry, mostly chickens, has been calcula calculated as about three times higher than the total biomass of all wild bird species combined. The rise in the number of domesticated chickens over recent decades mirrors the decline in the population numbers of wild bird species, particularly, particularly those that are most common. This monospecific vast bird biomass is unprecedented in Earth's his recent history and perhaps also in Earth's geological history. While fossil bird populations are difficult to estimate, it's thought that the most common wild bird in human history, the passenger pigeon, had a population of 3 to 5 billion in the 1800s. Okay, so that's just crazy. I mean, that we, we now have a monoculture of birds that exceeds the population of the passenger pigeon. So in genetic terms, the chicken is a very... Um, prolific species it's done very well and it's done very well in large part to us um but i guess there's risks with monocultures i mean we see this with crops as well if there's some kind of outbreak or if there's some kind of disease it can affect that monoculture greatly if we're depending on chickens to be our main source of protein 
which it looks like they are currently, then it's risky to have everything be one species because if something came through and wiped everything out, we'd be in a lot of trouble and we kind of have to start over with an entirely different species. So it's, it's, a, it's a risky gamble in, in terms of food security, I would say. Back to the paper, the global range of modern broilers in comparison with the geographically restricted range of, of their jungle fowl ancestors is in part a factor of their climate controlled housing conditions. The vertical integration of farming systems of industrial production is reliant on the technosphere. Broiler farming is undertaken with a complex mechanized system that operates with the integration of computer software, uh, software electricity, transportation, yada yada. Breeding by natural selection has been modified by human directed selection. While the size of domesticated chicken in historical times was little different to the red jungle fowl, domestic chicken bone morphology shows that the selective breeding practices took place as early as the 16th century. Chickens from the late 20th century are markedly different in terms of size and growth rate and body shape. The change in body mass and body shape has been visually documented by photographs of broiler breeds throughout uh, on Ontogeny, uh, that is development from 1957 to 1978 and 2005. Broilers from a 1957 breed are between one fourth and one fifth of the body weight of broilers from a 21st century breed. The modern broiler is a distinctive new morphotype with a relatively wide body shape, a low center of gravity, and multiple osteopathologies. If left to live to maturity, broilers are unlikely to survive. In one study, increasing their slaughter age from five weeks to nine weeks resulted in a sevenfold increase in mortality rate. The rapid growth of the leg and breast muscle tissue leads to a relative decrease in the size of other organs, such as the heart and lungs, which restricts, restricts their function and thus longevity. Changes in the center of gravity of the body, reduced pelvic limb muscle mass, and increased pectoral muscle mass cause poor locomotion and frequent lameness. Unlike most other neobiota, this new broiler morphotype is shaped by and unable to live without intensive human intervention. So this paper is basically saying that we have changed chickens so much that they can no longer survive without our intervention. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that's like that. I mean, I kind of wonder about domesticated dogs um, some of them have been changed so much by artificial selection. I kind of wonder how they would survive in the wild. I think that selective pressure would slowly morph them back into something that was a bit more wolf-like than, say, a chihuahua. I think that something similar is going on here. And as I mentioned, I don't think that chicken as a food tastes as good as it used to. And it's because we've changed these animals so much that they are just big chunks of meat with some feathers on them and they aren't really viable biological organisms. They're totally dependent on us. Um, it's, it's kind of a bizarre thought. Um, and I think that a lot of us in our minds have this idea of the chicken as a, you know, from, from earlier times that this, there's a chicken that's living on a farm and pecking around and eating bugs and things like that. And the truth is they're, they're in this factory environment. They're being fed corn. They're not moving as well as they should. And, you know, the result is it's something that doesn't taste very good. Our, our sense of what chicken tastes like may be very different from what our grandparents tasted in chicken. All right, back to the paper. So naturally omnivorous, the diet of the broiler chicken has become more grain-based with approximately 60% 60, 60 of broiler feed composed of cereals such as maize, wheat, and barley. Diets vary globally with maize most commonly, maize is corn, most commonly used in the USA because it has a higher nutrient value than other cereals. Additions to the dietary cereals can include fish meal and reprocessed hatchery and broiler waste. So they're basically feeding dead chickens and eggshells and chicks back to the chickens gross the alteration to the chickens diet is designed to reduce the amount of feed used while increasing meat yields however it also homogenizes nutritional intake eliminating a source of natural variation within the stock the current plateau is broiler growth rates may not be maintained 
with current research focusing on new technologies to increase the protein intake of broiler diets, diets by using insta insect meal instead of plant proteins. So I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. So they go on to the paper goes on to say that global human trends toward increased animal protein consumption, along with an increased human population, is impacting on land use and wild species. Chickens have the greatest feed efficiency of any farmed animal species, but their numerical dominance is reflected in feed consumption. In the U.S., the combined feed consumption by broiler and egg-laying chickens has been calculated as 58 megatons of, of dry concentrates, grains, and byproducts per year, the greatest feed volume of any farmed animal group. Overall, the land area required to produce feed for chickens is lower than for pigs and cattle, so that's good. Um... Nevertheless, the land area and reactive nitrogen emitted from the production of chicken feed is significantly higher than that used to grow crop grow crops. The total global energy consumption used in the broiler production system in Europe is estimated to be higher than that for the product production of beef or pork, all, although a global data analysis is yet to be under, uh, taken. So when they say that the chickens are changing the biosphere what they mean is that through these through these through growing grain for these animals we're changing the planet and then we're feeding it to these chickens and that's land that maybe potentially would have been used by other native bird species so there's sort of this indirect effect of growing chickens. It's not the chickens themselves that are changing the biosphere very much. I mean, maybe in the sense of their waste and, and things like that, but it's also just that we're changing the planet to feed these chickens, mostly in the form of corn. Okay, so now the paper is getting down to the brass tacks. If you were an alien archeologist and you were coming to earth and you came down to our layer in the earth millions of years in the future and you came down to our layer of earth what would you find would you find a bunch of chicken bones would the chicken bones just have you know disintegrated so this is addressed in the next part of the paper what is the potential for broilers to become fossilized bird carcasses in the wild are scavenger and decay prone and so do not commonly fossilize chicken bones by contrast are often sold intact within products for human consumption, such as chicken wings, drumsticks, and whole birds. And post-consumption, the discarded bo bones form a common component of ordinary landfill sites as part of domestic garbage. The low skeletal density of chicken bones would normally mitigate, mitigate against long-term preservation potential. However, organic materials are often well-preserved within landfill deposits, where anaerobic conditions means that, mean that bones do not so much degrade as mummify. The osteopathology of modern broiler bones could be used as additional stratigraphic characteristic of late 20th century birds which have been bred for weight gain and or fast growth. Further research is needed to document the extent of the occurrence and type of osteopathologies in broilers in the 20th century in order to better constrain their incidence through this time interval. Carcasses can be disposed of in on-farm burial pits from routine losses during production or as mass burials at landfills resulting from the depopulation of flocks affected by pathogenic outbreaks of avian influenza, as well as 10 million, 10 million poultry uh, who were euthanized in South Korea in 2008. The broiler chicken is therefore likely to leave a widespread and distinctive biostratigraphic signal. Biostratigraphic would just be, <clears throat> you know, a biological signal in the rocks, basically. Um, as a key fossil index taxon of the Anthropocene. Its potential in this respect is similar to that of other anthropogenic materials which have appeared or exponentially accumulated in volume. These include during the great acceleration from the mid 20th century materials such as plastic, concrete, and spheroidal car carbonaceous particles. I don't know what that, <laughs> what that refers to. Broilers are globally distributed and their carcasses have accumulated in settings which lead to good fossil preservation potential. Chicken bones, though not as homogeneously distributed, distributed as some geological anthropogenic markers such as radionuclides, will be abundant at landfill sites 
and other widely distributed accumulations. Radionuclides there is referring to um, nuclear bomb tests that spread little nu nuclear radioactive particles across the earth. So those would show up too um, in the rock layers. Given this global distribution, together with its huge population size and distinctive biology, genetics, and bone geochemistry, the boiler chicken may be viewed as a key species indicator of the proposed Anthropocene epoch. So they're basically saying there that if an alien archaeologist came down and dug it, dug things up, they from from our time period that we're living in, they would probably find plastic, concrete, radiation, and chicken chicken bones so there you go folks great work finally the authors conclude that the advent of the fast-growing broiler morph morphotype in the 1950s and its uptake across industrial farms worldwide can be viewed as a near synchronous global signal of change to the biosphere currently maintained by humans and the technosphere modern broiler chickens are morphologically genetically and isotopically isotopically diff distinct from domestic chickens prior to the mid 20th century the global range of modern broilers and biomass dominance over other bird species is a product of human intervention. As such, broiler chickens vividly symbolize the transformation of the biosphere to fit evolving human consumption patterns and show clear potential to be a biostratigraphic marker species of the Anthropocene. All right, so I really have to say that having read this paper, I'm pretty grossed out about eating chicken. We typically do try to buy organic chicken or free range chicken when we can. It's not always possible. It's not always economic. Um, but, you know, obviously the whole factory farming thing is a bit disturbing, to be honest. And I just don't think that eating animals that are so dependent on us to survive is necessarily a good thing. I agree with the authors that that chickens have been changed so much genetically, we've basically turned them into these sort of hyper-growing giants that they are fundamentally different than what the birds that they started from. And um, I'd be curious to know, you know, if there's any actual nutritional difference in the chickens of today versus like Roman times or even like before 1950 when apparently these this vertical integration this factory farming started i subjectively have noticed a difference again in the taste and the sort of internal structure of the chicken i don't know if that's has to do with genetic changes or how they're being held uh, and farmed but i think that buying chicken that's grown in a way that the chicken actually gets to behave like a bird and isn't confined isn't part of this factory system you're probably going to get a better tasting chicken it's probably going to be healthier i'm imagining that the omega-3 content is going to be higher as to whether the chicken is the is a marker species for the anthropocene i think that the authors have made a pretty good argument i think that the only question that still remains, and it seems like it's a question of the paper, is whether chicken bones would be preserved and fossilized in a similar way that to how um, you know other fossils are preserved. But given the fact that things don't really tend to break down in landfills, uh, I think that they have a pretty good argument there. So that's it for this video. Thanks for watching. I'm curious if you agree or disagree with these authors that the chicken is a good marker for the Anthropocene. Let me know in the comments below. Also, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and subscribe to the Science Centric channel. We're working on bringing you weekly content that's going to be vlogs and little short videos explaining concepts in science. So please stay tuned to the channel. And we're just getting started. So uh, until next time, I'm Eric Olson.